Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us here at CSIS. For those of you who have not made a, your first visit to the building, I uh, offer you a special welcome. Before we get started, I want to point out the uh, emergency exits through the main doors in which you came today. Also around the corner to the left, there's another emergency exit. And then in the back left corner near the little lounge area, there's an exit there as well. My name is Tom Sanderson. I am the director of the Transnational Threats Project here at CSIS. Happy to welcome you here. Um, we are currently, as a little bit of background, conducting two studies that are ongoing. Foreign fighter study, looking at Turkey, looking at Tunisia, looking at several other nations and the phenomenon of foreign fighters. Just had an interesting conversation with Steve Kappas about privacy and the foreign fighter issue and our values, and I think maybe we'll get to that today. We're also looking at militancy across the Sahel region with our Africa program run by Jennifer Cook. We'll make a couple of field visits there in the fall. Um, before I get started, I want to recognize a few folks who've joined us. Judge William Webster, the former CIA and FBI director, and also the director of the Transnational Threats Project Senior Steering Committee is here. John McGaffin, a senior advisor to the program. Ron Marks as well, and John Nelson. And over here, Ambassador Claudia Fritchie from Liechtenstein. Thank you for joining us. And uh, I'd also like to uh, welcome Dick O'Neill, one of our advisors who's sitting in the back. Let me first start off with uh, brief bios on our two guests today. Very happy to have such luminaries here to discuss what we're um, covering with ISIS and the degrade and defeat exercise we're doing today. David Ignatius to my right, associate editor and columnist for the Washington Post, is an incredible career in journalism, long and distinguished, including since 2003, a twice weekly globally distributed column on global politics, economics, and international affairs. He was the executive director of the International Her Her executive editor of the International Herald Tribune, now known as the International New York Times. He was the foreign editor of the Post from 1990 to 92, and for the Wall Street Journal, David served as a reporter, Middle East correspondent, and as chief diplomatic correspondent. He has published frequently in Foreign Affairs, the New York Times Magazine, Atlantic Monthly, and others. David is also the author of nine novels, including Body of Lies, which was made into a movie starring Leonardo DiCaprio. His latest novel, The Director, is about hacking and espionage, certainly a timely topic. He's a fellow at Harvard's Kennedy School's Belfer Center and has taught as an adjunct lecturer at the Harvard Kennedy School. Stephen Kappas, to my left, is currently a partner and chief operating officer of Torch Hill Investment Partners in Washington, D.C. He retired from the Central Intelligence Agency as deputy director after 30 years of service. From 2006 to 2010, he was directly involved in the leadership and management of all elements of the agency under two different directors and two presidential administrations. Mr. Kapp has served as Deputy Director of Operations for the CIA, the senior most position in our nation's clandestine services. During that period, he led over one third of the CIA's globally deployed personnel and directed the agency's global espionage operations. Relationships with foreign intelligence partners in the National Security Council mandated covert action operations. Mr. Kappas led in Washington and Libya the U.S. government operation that contributed to the Libyan government renunciation of their weapons of mass destruction program. Steve has immense experience in the field, including service as an operations officer in South Asian and Middle Eastern countries, as deputy chief of an overseas operational element focused on Iran, chief of station in a Middle Eastern country during the 1991 Persian Gulf War, and was chief of station in a large Central Eurasian country. Steve studied and used Farsi and Russian languages in the course of his assignments. His awards include the Presidential National Security Medal, the National Intelligence Distinguished Service Medal, the CIA Distinguished Career Intelligence Medal, two Distinguished Intelligence Medals, three Director's Medals, and the Donovan Award for Operational Excellence. Suffice to say, we have here today two of the most distinguished national security and intelligence experts you could possibly want to weigh in on the subject at hand. That subject, of course, is the Islamic State of Iraq and al-Sham, or Greater Syria. Nearly one year ago, upstairs, we brought together David, Steve, and Ambassador Zalmay Khalilzad to discuss the issues surrounding ISIS soon after the group rolled into Mosul, Iraq, surprising those who were not watching the years-long evolution of the former Iraqi affiliate of al-Qaeda and its subsequent transition into an independent entity called ISIS. In the short span of one year, ISIS has become one of the most critical threats and challenges facing Iraq, the Middle East, and dozens of countries beyond, including the United States. 
ISIS has attracted at least 22,000 fighters from more than 100 countries. So half the world have fighters represented in Iraq and Syria at some point over the last four years. This rep represents a tremendous blowback potential against members of the coalition in other countries as well. Young men with battlefield experience, confidence, networks, and tremendous motivation could return home to their home countries and initiate attacks. For certain, their exploits on the battlefield transmitted in great detail by some of the 90,000 daily messages coming from ISIS have radicalized and inspired citizens of several countries to attack in defense of ISIS and to promote the group's agenda. We've seen this in Australia, the United States, Egypt, Canada, Tunisia, France, Belgium, Libya, Kuwait, Yemen, Saudi Arabia, and many others. Before we look at the current and future potential challenges posed by ISIS and the conditions that brought us to where we are today, it is important to look back over the past year at some of the major events that have transpired since we met and since Mosul fell on June 10th, 2014. Some of those are notable. This is not an exhaustive list. But on June 29, 2014, ISIS leader Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi declared a new Islamic caliphate and declared himself as caliph. Baghdadi invited Muslims around the world to journal, journey to this new Islamic state. This declaration and call to service has been a tremendous stimulant and magnet for tens of thousands of people. In early August of last year, ISIS attacked members of Iraq's Yazidi minority, prompting President Obama to launch limited airstrikes against ISIS while also dropping supplies to the Yazidis. Airstrikes increased in number in the days and weeks as they, as they proceeded. On August 19th and again on September 2nd, ISIS executed American hostages Jim Foley and Stephen Sotloff. British and Japanese hostages would su subsequently be murdered by ISIS. On September 8th, the Iraqi Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki was replaced by Haider al-Abadi, who joined us here a few weeks ago, in the face of tremendous pressure from both inside and outside of Iraq. Two days later, on September 10th, President Obama announced the International Coalition to Combat ISIS. And on September 24th, 2014, President Obama, speaking at the UN, spoke out against ISIS. ISIS supporters begin appearing around the region at this time, with groups in Egypt, Sinai, and in Libya declaring allegiance or acting on behalf of ISIS. In February 2015, ISIS released a video showing the burning to death of Jordanian F-16 pilot Kassas Bey, who was shot down during an operation over Syria. ISIS also executed Christians in Libya, destroyed the ancient Iraqi city of Nimrud, secured a pledge of allegiance from Boko Haram in Nigeria, claimed responsibility for the Bardo Museum attack in Tunisia, and a massive suicide bombing in Yemen. In May of this year, we saw Delta Force operators, U.S. Army Delta Force operators, penetrate Syria and kill a senior ISIS leader during a firefight. The next day, May 17th, ISIS took Ramadi, Iraq, and four days later, they take the ancient city and ruins of Palmyra, Syria. And on June 10, President Obama authorized the deployment of 450 additional advisors to Iraq. And last week, of course, we had the attacks in Tunisia and Kuwait. That's quite a toll for a year, and the impact goes well beyond the simple body count to include the political, economic, social, and diplomatic strains inflicted on millions of people. Now, as we look forward, there are many difficult decisions and considerations for a lot of parties to consider. For the next 45 minutes, I'll put a number of those issues before Steve and David, after which you all have an opportunity to ask questions of your own. So with that, let me begin by asking both of you, since we last met in July of 2014, what has surprised you most about how events have unfolded in Iraq and Syria and with the broader anti-ISIS effort? David? Well, let me uh, begin um, by looking back at what we said in July uh, of, uh, of last year. Uh, that was, um, I think both Steve and I had a, a pretty, uh, what was seen then as an alarmist view, uh, warning about the danger that was ahead. The two biggest surprises to me in the year since then have been the resilience strange combination of resilience, brutality, and creativity, operational creativity of the Islamic State. Um, they are agile, uh, they uh, use, they concentrate force to achieve their objectives. They send, you know, as in the capture of Ramadi, 
uh, five to eight uh, suicide bombs, one after the other, bang, bang, bang. Um, and, and, they, and they terrify and intimidate their opponents. Uh, so they have been stronger, tougher, smarter than I would have thought. I, I had the hope a year ago that like Al-Qaeda in Iraq, uh, Zarqawi's group, they would burn so hot that they would burn themselves out. Th that hasn't happened yet. The second surprise in this year, to be honest, is the uh, lack of effectiveness and clarity of U.S. policy, U.S.-led policy in, in response. Uh, I wrote a column uh, around June 11, uh, noting that this week had two uh, manifestos about this conflict. One was uh, uh, an <coughs> ISIS video called A Year After the Conquest. I don't invite anybody to look at it on, online because it's so horrifying. But it, it, it shows with that, that sort of video style that uh, their people have developed uh, the overwhelming uh, force and brutality of their conquest of Mosul, how they routed uh, the Iraqi security forces from Mosul, the seeming jubilation of Sunnis in the city after their, after their victory. A and noted the other manifesto of that week was the uh, Obama administration announcing it would send an incremental, careful new force, 450 train and uh, advise uh, special operations forces to Al Qadim in eastern Anbar province who would generally, at least as far as we can tell, not get outside the wire of that base, who would not uh, go with the uh, Iraqi forces they were training uh, into, into battle. Um, there, so far as I can tell, still are not sufficient numbers of Sunni tribesmen who want to be trained by these U.S. train and advise uh, forces that are in, in place now, uh, as had been the case, I, I think in an al-Assad air base uh, further west. So uh, the U.S., the, 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 the ISIS uh, assault uh, is, you know, at, at uh, hyperspeed for an insurgency. The U.S. response, I think, is at slow speed uh, as the president kind of rations each additional piece of his response. Um, and uh, if that formula continues without, without a change, I think a year from now, when we come back, we'll see a, an ISIS taking deeper roots in North Africa, spreading more deeply, uh, still unchecked in Iraq and Syria. <coughs> so that's a, a pessimistic opening, but, but, but frankly, that's, that's what I see in the past year. Thank you, David. Stephen, I, I don't want to say that you agree with David by chance, but uh, what else do you see beyond that? I would add, part of my thinking about it center is possibly more on disappointment than it does on surprise. Last year, about this time, we outlined clearly what, at least I did, what I thought was not just a aggressive, violent group, but also true forces of evil. I mean, there's no other way to describe people who are doing what they're doing to fellow citizens of the world, people of similar populations, both in Iraq and Syria. I think that I have probably been surprised that they have been able to fight as hard as they have fought and to recover as quickly as they have from some significant poundings by the United States from the air. Now, like most of you in this audience, I'm a student of history and, and we all know that nothing ends from the air alone, but it is still significant when that sort of ordinance lands on top of you and you recover. I think part of it is that we as the United States always underestimate the ability of groups like ISIS to sustain serious injuries and deaths and yet still press on because the truth of the matter is the Central Command does not care about the deaths and the injuries to the people that work for them. They're only concerned about their, their small, what I call almost Bolshevik-like group of real dedicated radicals and believers in the movement. So I was surprised at that, their ability to recover so quickly. I also am concerned that we aren't maintaining all the lessons that we have learned from our own 9-11 experience in terms of the interest and the willingness of these groups to press on against the United States in particular. When we don't take a firm stance, 
they fill every space of that that they possibly can as quickly as they can. When we're not prepared to lead in an aggressive fashion, I'm not talking about necessarily in a military fashion, but in an overall aggressive fashion, they will fill every second of that, that vacuum that they can find. And as a result, they therefore position themselves, particularly with Sunnis, who now, who, and their, their ability to move this propaganda is quite interesting, their ability to align us with Iran, even given what we've gone through since 1979 with Iran, is quite startling. And the number of people that actually believe it is even more startling. So the ability of the Middle East to build conspiracies and to spread them has worked to them and more quickly than I would have thought of even in just one year. But I don't think their approach <coughs> and their use of violence and their use of the evil forces that they, that they do use has changed at all. And as a result, I find myself more worried this year than I was 12 months ago when we were here. Well, let's move on to the strategy. Do we have a strategy, David and Steve, uh, and what is missing from that strategy? We have a declaratory strategy, and personally, I would say that elements of that strategy as declared are pretty much the right ones. The problem is that we have not found a way to implement the strategy. So let me unpack that a little bit. Uh, what President Obama did a year ago through the summer uh, into September was to refuse pleas, entreaties that the United States use its military power, use its air power in particular, uh, to uh, take out the enemies of uh, the Shiite-led government in Iraq, take out uh, ISIS, until there were changes in that government. Uh, and it was a high-stakes uh, uh, effort by the president insisting that Nouri al-Maliki uh, sh should leave and that, and that a new uh, 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 prime minister, new member, representative of his, of his Dawa party should uh, take office, as he did uh, with uh, Haider al-Abadi. Al so that part of U.S. policy I thought was correct, was handled in a disciplined way. Um, it was necessary to get Iran's acceptance of that change of, of Shiite leadership in Iraq. Um, and, and again, I thought that that was, that that was uh, done well. Um, a second thing that was part of the strategy was to build an international coalition. Uh, and uh, General John Allen went around the world. Uh, there were meetings. The coalition was assembled. Um, and uh, in terms of working with allies, it's hard for me to fault that in principle. That was the right thing to do. The list is, is a good list. When you know, one member of that coalition, Jordan, was attacked in such a vicious way, the Jordanians responded strongly and seemed to have uh, popular uh, support. Another part of the strategy was to find a way to mobilize the elements in Iraq that would have to be part of uh, evicting ISIS from Sunni areas, the Sunni tribes, the Sunni leadership, empowering them uh, in this uh, badly sectarian uh, Iraq in a way that they would be effective uh, implementers of the strategy when you would ask, what's the defeat mechanism? Who's going to defeat these people in, in Mosul, in, in Anbar? The answer was, you know, in, in part uh, uh, the best Iraqi security forces, but aided by the tribes who can immediately come in behind the, the, the clearing force. That still hasn't happened uh, adequately. It's amazing to me when, you know, uh, many months ago you had the Iraqi defense minister visiting Amman talking about the uh, plans, facilities for training uh, Sunni tribes, tribal fighters in Jordan. You had camps set up. You had you know, all the pieces of that assembled. And yet, uh, to, to this moment, so far as I know, it really still is, is in embryo. Um, I'd say the same thing about the regional strategy. We nominally have a coalition that includes Turkey, Jordan, Saudi Arabia. Go down the list. We have this implicit working uh, understanding with Iran. And yet, uh, those elements, I, I don't think, have been mobilized. What exactly what our, our strategy is with Turkey, if anyone in this audience could please inform me, I would be very grateful. So you know, I, 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 I'll close by saying uh, the pieces of the strategy are there. The ability to implement it isn't. 
maybe in a few minutes I'd, li I'd like to talk about the bureaucratic side of that, the lack of unity of command in this government to make that strategy happen, but I'll, I'll leave it there for now. Steve, can the tribal groups be brought to bear here, or is this uh, once bitten, twice shy? Well, I think that historically the tribal groups have been bit more than once, and not just in this <clears throat> not just in the last hundred years. I think it becomes extremely difficult to mobilize the tribal groups if they do not sense from you a commitment that you're prepared to stay through the difficult periods of combat and open aggression and into the political transition so they can have some confidence that they will not lose when, we, when someone walks away those things they've earned through their own blood, their own treasure. As a result, I'm afraid that that becomes even a more difficult piece of work than it was when we first did it as a country, as a government, as a Department of Defense, as an agency in the heel of the, through the surge earlier in the, in the past decade. I would suggest that it will take someone with extraordinary persuasive skills and someone with extraordinary staying power to remain involved in both the movement of the Sunni tribes as well as the reintegration into the Iraqi government. Because it is my understanding that the distrust between the Sunni tribes and the current Iraqi government is in some ways almost at its highest levels, even beyond some of the times that Dave and I are familiar with you know, prior to 2010. Uh, I think they've remained part of the solution, but distrust develops very quickly and takes a very long time to dispel. So as a result, I would advocate it as part of an overall strategy, but I would not have the same confidence that we had once before that it would be as successful or as effective as it once is earlier. And plus, quite frankly, every time a Shia militia stands up and starts shooting at ISIS, then they whisper that to the Sunni tribes the minute after it happens. So as a result, it becomes a self-propagating propaganda machine in support of ISIS, regardless of what they may think about the methods of ISIS. So I'm afraid at this particular moment, I'm a little bit pessimistic, <coughs> but still believe it should be intertwined with the actual overall policy. Thank you. Before I get to the next question, let me recognize the ambassador from Iraq to the United States, Ambassador Faley. Thank you for joining us. That brings us to a question about Iraq. What about our Iraq first policy? Is there a danger in focusing so much on Iraq and leaving so much in Syria uh, untouched? And how do we deal with the Iraqi government? It's a complicated relationship. Uh, dealing with the Iraqi security forces, there's a lot of complications here. Let me take the second uh, part of that uh, first. Syria is, is such a complicated subject, I'd almost like to separate that and, 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 and come back to it. Um, thinking about uh, the slow progress in Iraq, uh, in many ways the lack of progress in this year, and what to do about it, um, I tried to think about the, the, the fundamentals and to talk with people smarter than me about this issue. One of them is sitting in the audience, Ambassador Feiley, um, uh, Steve Hadley, Barham Saleh, a number of other people uh, in and out of government, trying to think how could you take the elements of our strategy which seek to keep Iraq together in some way, that seek to uh, avoid this idea people have of, you know, the lines in the sand being just scattered to the winds and let's just, you know, plunge the whole region into uncertainty and chaos. How, how would you preserve Iraq but also um, speak to the Sunnis in a way that would give them more trust? Uh, they're the ones over time who are going to have to eradicate uh, ISIS in their, in their midst. And what I, I came to was a sort of, you know, version for 2015 of what uh, Jim Baker and Lee Hamilton wrote in 2006, looking at essentially the same problem. The problem hasn't really changed from what they were writing uh, uh, back then, nine, nine years ago. There's a uh, bottom-up or inside-out part of this, which is uh, to uh, find a way, uh, find a formula for a genuinely federal decentralized, maybe confederal Iraq that keeps the borders of the country uh, of the country as a whole but lets the individual groups uh, really have a kind of local autonomy. So Sunnis who are fighting to get ISIS out of Anbar have some confidence that when ISIS is out they won't uh, be given instructions from uh, Hydra al-Amri or the Shia militias or anybody else, that it'll be their part of Iraq. Uh, much as Kurds feel that Erbil is their part of Iraq. 
Uh, so that's a part of that strategy. It's, it's bottom up, inside out. And then there is an outside in part that involves the regional allies. Uh, and for each of these conflicts, Iraq, Syria, all the other ones, Libya, it is going to take a commitment by the United States, Russia, Saudi Arabia, Iran. I mean, somehow there's going to have to be a formula. We're going to have to live in a world where those powers can sit around a table and come up with agreements that, that they're prepared to, to back up. So I think those are the two elements of how you would uh, make this work in Iraq. Um, I think it's going to take discipline and time. Uh, it's probably the job of the next president of the United States. Uh, but I think that's, when it comes, that's what it will look like. Any comments here, Steve? Or? I would only add that I, I become concerned uh, over the last several years that we as a country have lost our ability to develop what I call a tapestry of policy, a tapestry of strategy. In other words, for all of us who have had children and grandchildren, you know the concept of small children soccer in which there's the ball and everyone goes to it. What I'm talking about is trying to weave together the programs because all these things are related so that you have a program which you've, you've connected the Syrian question with the Iraqi question and with the Egypt, Egyptian question with the Saudi question. And then of course you talk to the Russians and Chinese and others and the Iranians are part of this in a way that allows the United States to view it as a tapestry and as what is best for us. I worry at times that we, we've lost our ability to do that or we're not interested, I'm not sure what it is. And I, I'm afraid too that if we don't do that, it actually it could contribute to Iraq losing its ability to be a unitary state. With all due respect to the good ambassador, I'm concerned, and I hope I'm wrong, but I'm concerned that the trends are headed in the right direction of Iraq not being able to remain as a unitary state. And I think that would be terrible. I think that would be terrible for the citizens of Iraq, as well as for the region, as well as for the United States. And so I just think that we have a role here to play. And I know that we've been involved for over a decade in a lot of things. But I don't remember who said it, but someone said, you know, great powers aren't allowed to get tired. I'm afraid this is one of those instances in which we have to look at our ability to weave this program, weave this tapestry in a way that helps others find their way to this too, particularly our allies in the Middle East who are so <coughs> hesitant to take this on for a whole variety of reasons. Steve. <coughs> A lot of people discuss the progress or lack of progress against ISIS, and I think Americans tend to focus on the military-centric side of this. And there are, of course, many other elements, the diplomatic, the economic, the political. We've touched on some of those, the demographic. In many discussions we have here at CSIS with uh, Dr. Tony Cordesman and Dr. John Altman, we discuss a lot of those elements, and I hope they'll come up today. But let's do talk specifically about the kinetic effort here against ISIS. How are we doing on the battlefield, do you believe? and what needs to be brought to bear apart from all those other elements to be successful in the battle? Well, I think that's a difficult one for me to answer because I'm not seeing the, the daily take from the battlefield. But on the other hand, I would offer that in many ways this is similar to the old discussions of insurgencies, you know, post-World War II insurgencies where if the, the larger power is not cl clearly winning, then they're actually losing. So I think in this case, even though we have the ability to bring to bear significant power, there are some things that aren't on the ground at the moment, which I think when you talk to those who are most experienced and those who are currently involved, are quite significant. For example, the absence of forward air controllers reduces the capability, significance, and efficiency of your airstrikes. Mm -hmm. The lack of a logistics capability on the ground in Iraq is essential because the Iraqis, in many cases, there are some fine fighters, but they do not have the logistic skills of the United States. Therefore, they find themselves in isolated situations too quickly and too often. And when you cannot reinforce, if you think getting shot at takes the heart out of a, a soldier, try putting, letting them also realize that they're completely alone with no chance of reinforcement for ammo, people, or anything else. That really takes the heart out of the fighters, let alone if their officers then disappear. As a result, there are some fundamentals to military conflict which you cannot necessarily carry out from afar or from the sky. Many of these people in the room, I know you have read the studies of World War II and realized that Germany was not finished even though the fire bombings were as significant as they'd ever been in history. We did not end any part of the Vietnam War by B-52 bombings, significant in their impact, but people who are determined to survive will survive. As a result, and I'm not an advocate of simply cutting loose 
military forces and all of its impact and all of its force. I have had children in the military. But my point is, there are some almost like laws of physics that play here that if you can't get closer to the target, they're going to be able to withstand your attack. I refer people to the Japanese who would hunker down on the islands of the Pacific and undergo 20, 30 days of extraordinary bombardment and still be there when the Marines show up. There are things like that that can't be denied in terms of military combat. Now, war, as we all know, is a political action, but we may have to address that more honestly as a people, and I'm afraid that the only person that can actually address that when it becomes necessary is the President of the United States. Not a secretary, not a senior policy person. If it becomes necessary or if the decision is made that we have to be more effective in our military work, I'm afraid the President has to take that one on. David, a year from now, do you expect to see large deployments of U.S. forces in Iraq and potentially Syria? No, uh, I, I don't. I don't think as long as uh, Barack Obama is president, we'll see large military deployments. It's, it's possible that we could see the additional steps that Steve has urged and that I, I agree are, would, be, would be valuable, uh, uh, allowing uh, our advisors to go forward uh, with the Iraqi forces they're advising, whether they're uh, Sunni tribal fighters, Iraqi security forces, and uh, bolster them in combat, uh, lays targets for more effective close-in uh, air support. I can see those things happening. Um, I think we have to be honest looking at this. We have a president, but we also have a country that in many ways is allergic to Iraq. We lived through such a painful period after the 2003 invasion. I think it's widely shared, whatever uh, Jeb Bush may say when he's asked about it, it's a widely shared view that it was a mistake to have, to have done that, uh, and that beyond the mistake of invasion, there were so many mistakes made in how it was carried out during the period of occupation. So the American people, not unreasonably, uh, are very reluctant to get into the kind of large-scale involvement that you're, that you're asking about, and the, the president um, more than most Americans. Mm -hmm. And I think that reluctance just comes through in every moment of policy, and it then translates into the military. The military says, well, if we don't have a strategy all in for victory, you know, I don't want to send my guys back home in wooden boxes. <laughs> you know, militaries like de decisive, uh, wars with popular support where, you know, they, they can, you know, uh, they, ha they have a conclusive ending. We don't live in a, in a period in which, in which that's possible. And I do worry sometimes that the military um, is, is seeking something that, that isn't possible. Let me say one more thing that um, concerns me, uh, especially in this period where the president is uh, I called him allergic to Iraq, that maybe overstates it, but certainly is reluctant here, uh, but has made a commitment, in his words, to degrade and ultimately destroy this adversary. What he needs above all, more than anything else, more than any particular you know, decision to send advisors forward or lays this, or he needs some one person who will take responsibility for this campaign. And every day, every morning, uh, when he asks the question, how are we doing in our battle against ISIS, will say, Mr. President, in the last 24 hours, we had this and this and this. Here are my biggest problems. Here, here's what we need to I'd ask you to focus on today. John Allen thought he'd been given that job when he was made special representative for the president to build the coalition to fight ISIS. That job, despite strenuous arguments to Obama, was not put at the White House, as many people thought it should be, but was put at the State Department. And from that moment, and that was what, roughly September, October of last year, you've had a series of uh, interagency fights, confusions, false starts, uh, where you have the CENTCOM commander, Lloyd Austin, asking the president, Mr. President, am I running this war? And the answer is, yes, you are. Uh, but then you have uh, a former four-star general who has been given the job by the president of running the coalition and the strategy. And so it's not surprising that you just, you know, with these competing authorities, um, have a, a kind of policy confusion that hurts our effort, 
I think, confuses our allies. So if there's one thing in this next year, you ask, where will we be in a year? That, 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 I think the president is not going to put tens of thousands of U.S. troops in. He doesn't have to if he'll put one person in as a decisive commander of this effort. The, the military pieces, the strategic pieces, the diplomatic and political pieces. Uh, and so and I think that is doable, even for, for, for this administration. Please, Steve. Please add to it. Uh, I, I'm a great believer in ambassadors. Uh, I've had the opportunity in my career to work with some people that I think are some brilliant ambassadors, the great Tom Pickering, Frank Wisner, Ryan Crocker, Ann Patterson, others who are designated by law and by the president's, by uh, their confirmation and by the president's direction to be the president's representative in these particular countries. When they have worked effectively with the senior military presidents in those countries, Ryan Crocker, David Petraeus is one example, that is an extraordinarily effective team for the United States of America that answers directly to the President of the United States. So we have, once again, all the tools in place to do the things we need to do and have used them before effectively. I'm always amazed and somewhat surprised at our, our ability to create new things that don't work as well as the things we just left behind. So as a result, I think if we return to that, so the, the ambassador who has a letter that says he or she is the president's representative and the president of the United States can speak to them directly and say, what is going on? What do you recommend? It focuses that energy. It focuses that ability. It also makes it easier for the president to actually have responsiveness in a way that he is not getting because the agencies are agencies, departments are departments. They will compete over who has what access to whom. And it does not work at the moment as effectively as it can with some of the past the names John Negroponte, others, some of you may know, of, of men and women who are extraordinary representatives of U.S. interests, U.S. strategy, and U.S. policy. And they can effectively manage the tools on the ground. Now, no one can manage the tools in the United States. I understand that. I'm talking about on the forward end of all this so that the president has the ability to know as best as is possible what's happening and therefore make decisions that are in the best interest of the United States people. That's what I worry about in terms of our unwillingness to look at those things in a way that's quite open and quite honest. Thank you. David, you're one of our nation's leading journalists. You're involved in social media. You see how robust that field is. You understand messaging. How can we counter 90,000 messages a day that are disseminated by supporters that stimulate and invigorate this worldwide movement? Uh, part of the puzzle in your question is, is the word uh, we. Um, how is this counter-messaging going to be organized? To what extent is it going to be an effort of the U.S. government and other governments? To what extent is it spontaneous? Does it represent the youth of the region? Uh, my friends from the Arab world keep insisting to me that as, that as powerful and intimidating as IS messaging is, what's still dominant on social media in Arabic is what I'd call um, the, fr the freedom uh, spirit, the, the, the Tahrir Square uh, statement. I'm a citizen. I'm not going to be pushed around. I, have, I can communicate. I have my device. I'm connected. I'm not going to take it anymore. I won't take it from a mullah. I won't take it from, uh, from uh, an authoritarian leader. Uh, you know, I, I'm going mm -hmm. to live in my own world. And somehow um, that... Uh, uh, message that that uh, spirit of uh, of connectedness. I think of, of of free citizens, which is still there. We get too depressed about the Arab winter sometimes. It's still there, as near as I can tell. Somehow that has to become the, the more of the the, the dominant narrative. Um, it probably needs help uh, from governments, but I worry in the post Snowden age about. Uh, swallowing the poison pill. I, I worry about um, uh, steps that seem sensible in terms of messaging that end up uh, limiting the message or, or undercutting it. So I think this is an area where it's crucial uh, to, to, to get it right. Uh, but uh, you know, the one thing I think the US has learned is the United, the United States is not a credible messenger in telling young Muslims what yep. Islam is, how they should live, who their the right enemies and allies are. That has to come from the region, and it has to be mobilized quickly. There are lots of smart people I know 
uh, who, who could, could help do this tomorrow. Um, but, the, but the pathway for them to do it that doesn't end up, as I say, undercutting their efforts in the future is very complicated. Yeah. Judge Webster and I had lunch a few weeks ago, and we discussed the, the video showing the burning of the Jordanian pilot and how something like that could resonate with people around the world. And the discussion we had focused on the fact that it resonates with so many of these young men who are marginalized in every way, socially, politically, economically, and who see an opportunity for mobilization, a sense of purpose, a mission in, in a video like that, which is awful and unbelievable for all of us, a meeting out of justice. Someone who flew an airplane, bombed civilians in their mind, and then pays for uh, his deeds in the same way they did. And that kind of messaging is very difficult to defeat. And I agree with you, young, young men, especially those under 40, there is no mainstream message for them to latch on to. They've already rejected that. They've already been pushed to the margins. And I don't think there is a message that actually can reach a lot of them, that small number. A broader audience, perhaps, but I, I, I'm afraid that when a video comes out like that and it's accepted by so many people, uh, we're in tremendous trouble here. Steve, I want to take advantage of your background in intelligence here, which is uh, impressive, to say the least. And you've touched on a few of these things before, but can you talk about some of the intelligence challenges here? And before, before you answer, I'll say, when we had a lot of troops on the ground, and I'm not suggesting that we do this again, but when you have 100,000 troops on the ground, you have a huge station active in a place like Baghdad and other places, you have a lot of people forward, a lot of intelligence personnel, a lot of opportunities to network with people on the ground, citizens of a country like Iraq, to develop the kind of sense and situational awareness that can enable your operations. What are the intelligence challenges with such a small footprint on the ground, and also given an adversary like ISIS? Well, let's divide it into three pieces, if you will, uh, for collection the two pieces, both technical and human. And then in this type of environment, intelligence also plays what I call as a state statecraft role, which is an influence role, which is supportive of US policy with groups and others who they are in contact with many cases for liaison services, but let's think about it for a second, those three categories. If we're looking at the Iraq-Syria theater, they're different too. In Iraq, there are still a significant number of what I call forward platforms from which you can launch. It makes common sense, of course, that the closer you can get to the target, the easier it is to recruit to actually collect intelligence. In Iraq, there are still significant possibilities from which they can launch, and there is, it's my understanding, some solid collection. It's never good enough but there's collection that is solid. Now, remember now, and I do this for my soapbox, in the intelligence business, there are secrets, and then there are also mysteries. My example of that is always, remember the young fruit vendor who set himself on fire in Tunisia that started in many ways much of this. There's no one on the planet. There's probably no one in the universe except God who knew what was going on in that, that Tunisian's head when he decided to set himself on fire. So, there are mysteries that are taking place out there in terms of what ISIS is deciding to do. Their ability to also close their ranks. Once again, I use my example of the Bolsheviks, what's only known by two or three or four people. And also, don't forget that espionage is still in all countries punishable by, in many cases, imprisonment, but by ISIS, it's punishable by horrific deaths. So when you're asking people to do things that put their lives and their families' lives in immediate jeopardy, Understand it's not that easy to step right up and just say, whatever you want, United States, I'm happy to help. So always keep that in mind when you're thinking about intelligence collection. Now, Syria becomes even a more difficult challenge. Remember, Bashar al-Assad's father, Hafez al-Assad, actually constructed what some could call a Stalin-like state in terms of its security services and their ability to control and suppress the people. Very skilled, very effective, very dangerous. This is also a country that has decided it's okay to drop barrel bombs on their own people. So as a result, you already highlight the difficulties of the collection problem. The collection problem is also compounded because moving forward in Syria, you have to spend just as much time trying to stay alive as you do having to try to figure out how to collect things. So as a result, I would identify at the moment the Syrian challenge is probably greater than the Iraqi challenge because we still have longstanding relationships in Iraq that are quite productive. I would offer, though, that at the moment, once again, with deference to the ambassador, 
the relationships with time are not as easy or as efficient as they were as recently as four, five, six, seven years ago. So that makes it difficult too, and so there has to be a reliance on partners. I would like to compliment the Jordanians. The Jordanians have once again stepped up and put their people in harm's way, and indeed are on the ground and elsewhere to assist both publicly and clandestinely. Some of the other services are doing the best they can, but in some cases, the best they can is really not very good or certainly not good enough. So as a result, and I'm certainly not looking for the United States to lead everything. All I'm talking about in this arena that you've asked about, the United States has the ability to lead and to guide in a way that could be effective. And so as a result, those relationships with foreign countries become very important in trying to persuade them and convince them this work with us is effective for them too. Now, one comment I'd like to make in reference to the messaging piece. The advent of social media, the ability to put stories out quickly, the abilities to spread fabrications is greater than it has ever been. So as a result, the work of intelligence officers, I think, is becoming increasingly difficult because the one question we all have always asked ourselves is, has what I've just received or just heard, is it true? Because I have a sense now that Mr. Lennon's famous sentence, which was, if you say a lie often enough, it becomes the truth, is actually becoming more and more prevalent in the Middle East as well. And God knows the Middle East has created some conspiracies in the last five or 600 years. But the point is, it's not just a matter of collecting the information and saying that this man said this because he was there. It's also a matter of before it goes to the president saying, is this actually true? Did this happen? There used to be something we used to call it Afghan math. John McGaff will remember this, in which an Afghan would say, we just attacked the Soviets and we killed 400 people. We go, ooh, wait a minute. How many people did you kill? OK, it was about 200. Ooh, ooh, slow down there. How many people was it? Well, maybe it was about four guys in a Jeep. My point to that is that in the current environment, these things become important because what you don't want to have is a president making bad judgments or bad information and also becoming <clears throat> so anxious to deliver the information that you've not done what you need to do. I call it the ruthless application of your methodologies and asking the question, is it true? So the challenges are significant. On the Iraqi side, I think there's more opportunity for success. On the Syrian side, it becomes much more difficult, and it will rely, I think, a great deal on a very clear and efficient assistance from some of our close friends in the Middle East who have some uh, significant capabilities of their own. David, we've been focusing on ISIS. We've been focusing on the relationship with Iraq. We've touched on Syria and the intelligence side. But there's a big actor we haven't gone into uh, in great detail yet, and of course, that is Iran. With regard to ISIS and what's going on in Iraq and in Syria, they cannot be divorced, certainly from the perspective of the Iranians. Is Iran playing offense or defense here with what they're doing? Are they more afraid of ISIS coming in and creating a state inside of Iraq, or are they trying to take advantage of this, or both? Well, I, I think they're being opportunistic uh, as, uh, as always. So sometimes that, that is offense, sometimes it's defense, sometimes most of the time, it's, it's a combination. Um, I just should, should note before uh, focusing on Iran, something we haven't talked about but is, is important when you think going forward. Although the U.S. Has, has not been successful overall, it has had great success in working with its friends in Kurdistan. The Kurdish platform for uh, military and other operations is powerful. Uh, I traveled uh, in Kurdistan the, from Erbil all the way to the west and then down into Nineveh province outside of Kurdistan with the Peshmerga uh, a few months ago and saw how the Peshmerga uh, working uh, quietly with uh, elements of U.S. and coalition power ha have pushed ISIS back. In Kirkuk, they've held their own. There's a sort of uh, continuing uh, battle between the forces in Kirkuk and the main uh, ISIS camp. I think it's called Hawija uh, to the uh, southwest. Uh, but that's a success, and it'd be a mistake not to note it um, in this discussion and not to think, how do you build on it? You know, the question has been, should you send weapons directly to them? That really is an issue uh, for uh, Ambassador Filey's government. Can they get weapons through into the, to the Kurds quickly enough that that option isn't 
discussed anymore. Um, the Iranians. Um, the Iranians, when you think about how the Kurdish forces were rocked in Erbil in August, September, how their lines really cracked, how dangerous it was, Erbil itself was threatened. And who was the first in? First in was Qasem Soleimani and, and the Quds Force supplying ammunition, supplying, I, I'm told, uh, individual people to help, you know, bolster the lines, to work with uh, the Peshmerga to get new people in, to get their command stronger. Erbil was saved, the U.S. came in after, and our help was also crucial. But um, the Iranians have a wealth of experience, contacts. They've been working, it's often the same case officers have been working the same uh, network of, of sources and assets for 20 years or more. They know this terrain. They, they know the Shia landscape, obviously. They know Kurdistan, you know, um, with meticulous detail. They have very good contacts uh, in the Sunni world. So, you know, we're fighting an adversary that made a vow after the Iraq-Iran war. Never again, never again will we allow Iraq to threaten our fundamental security, and they do everything they can to to prevent it. <clears throat> One more comment about, about, about Iran. As I've watched the Iranians and their proxies, the Shia militias, I've seen that they have uh, an ability to start fights but not to finish them, in part because the areas they're fighting are typically Sunni areas where uh, they are, they're, they're not uh, sufficiently welcome. So in Tikrit, the, the Shia militias moved on Tikrit and then got stalled. Uh, and U.S. air power came in and, and uh, finished that fight. But, but Tikrit still, from what I know, is largely unpopular. It's been impossible really to move enough people back in to, 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 to get the clear, get, get the hold and build part uh, going. You could argue the same uh, in Anbar province that, uh, that uh, Iran's strategy, whatever it is, um, you know, sh Iran shares in the in the terrible setbacks uh, in, in the, the, the loss of Anbar <coughs> province. So, um, how uh, U.S. and coalition operations will, with Iran will be shaped in the period after uh, a nuclear deal is reached, assuming that in the next couple weeks by July 9 that is that can be done I think is one of the real mm -hmm. challenges for for US and Iranian officials is it going to be possible to have some more effective alliance that draws in Sunni countries because you, you know I mean Saudi Arabia is going to have to be comfortable with that is 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 that going to be possible after a deal I don't know but that I'm sure going to be trying to find out uh, I've been a long believer and David knows this in, in engagement with Iran I think it's essential that I don't think you, we can go through life and not have engagement with a country like Iran. And, and so as a result, I, I'm hopeful that there's some agreement to be worked out. But whatever happens, what I don't want to see is a, a disconnection again in a way. I also am aware of Mr. Trillstro's comments about dealing with the devil. I get that. But I would like to offer a sharp criticism of Qasem Soleimani. Qasem Soleimani is a killer of Americans. He is responsible for the deaths of Americans, and he's still planning to kill Americans. So I don't want anyone to leave the room here thinking that Qasem Soleimani is the, somehow the Robin Hood of the Shia population, or he's the new Genghis Khan of the Middle East. Qasem Soleimani is a man who's opposed to the United States, everything we believe in, everything we do, and everything we try to do. So I would, I would just ask you to keep in mind, keep separate the differences between strategic engagement with Iran, which is important to U.S. security, and also somehow highlighting what some people are suggesting is the most wonderful, significant, smartest, powerful, and contributing member of the Middle East. I would offer to you it's not true. So Thank the, you for my soapbox. Moment. Absolutely. <laughs> so the enemy of our enemy is only a temporary partner. That's, well, that's what Mr. Churchill would say, and I'm yeah. sticking with him on this. Okay. <clears throat> Steve, you've had to deal with a lot of um, <clears throat> pretty unsavory regimes in the past in order to further national security goals. Two years ago, we wanted to get rid of Assad, but I think we've had a hands-off policy in order to not, one, not bring about a, a new Libya or even a Somalia as far as chaos. And number two, I think because as we negotiate a nuke deal with Iran, we want to keep that issue comfortable for the Iranians and not pull a, a, another leg from out underneath the stool that they're sitting on. How do we deal with Assad now? 
Well, that's an extraordinarily difficult question, as you know. I mean, I will now sound like what I am, a, a, a former CIA officer. CIA officers generally, it's my experience, believe in engagement with people. Part of it because we learned early on that if you are not engaged physically, if you're not engaged eye to eye, in some cases you have little to no chance of influencing their behavior. I would use, you were kind enough to refer to the Libyan experience, I would use as an example, once you get engaged with people who are, as you've described them, unsavory or unpleasant, if you hope to influence them and change them, you have to stay engaged. Now, in many cases, that's the reason why intelligence organizations are built to do that sort of thing. I do not know if there is engagement with the Syrians. I would hope that in some form or another, there is some discussion being taken place to show Bashar al-Assad that he has only two choices, to figure out an exit role of some kind or to die in Syria. Maybe like Mr. Gaddafi, that has been his plan all along. I don't know, but I don't, he doesn't strike me as the same type of person. I would think that we have to use whatever tools are available to try and engage Syria. And David has a, a very deep understanding of Syria, but to engage them in a fashion that tries to prevent this from creating an even greater opening, an even greater vacuum if Bashar al-Assad has exploded, died, killed, destroyed inside Damascus. Because my concern is that without some sort of assistance in shaping that future, there's nothing that can help you predict what group, what other sort of organization might take over inside Syria, and it could be far more radical than what they're currently dealing with. I think it is so uncertain at the moment mm -hmm. that there must be something we should think about doing to try and shape the future, shape the exit, regardless of who we have to do it with. Now, I would admit to you, and I'm not I know some people are quite capable of this, but it takes a certain sort of person to hang in there on this because it is really unpleasant work. Because you will be face to face with, in many cases, people that you had hoped you'd never, you would never meet. But the point is, if you don't engage it, then you have, you have absolutely no chance whatsoever of actually shaping because they will then formulate their thinking based on what they think you are thinking or what they think you are saying, and they will be getting it through second and third, in some case, fourth parties who are trying to interpret what's going on inside the United States. It's a very difficult task, but I think it's very important. Yeah. David, dealing with our adversaries, our enemies, is, of course, very difficult and complicated, but also dealing with our friends. Let's think about Turkey, uh, a NATO ally, uh, sharing a huge border with Syria. Uh, this has been a very difficult relationship over the uh, past four or five years. I've done field work on the border with Syria. I've interviewed militants from ISIS and the Nusra Front. There's clear evidence of these groups operating from the Turkish side of the border here. Um, how do we deal with Turkey, a nation that has very different strategic goals than we do when it comes to this region? Well, that's been a, a puzzle that um, the administration hasn't, hasn't been able to solve. Uh, we've had uh, the confusion of the Turkish parliamentary elections. It's still not clear how President Erdogan wants to play that in terms of whether the AK party will uh, try to govern alone and then call elections again soon or will seek a coalition partner. At least it wasn't clear uh, uh, as of last night. But um, that makes this confusing. You could argue that um, the Turks are now living with their own inability to make good policy decisions in that one of their nightmares is happening. Uh, the PYD, the, the Syrian Kurdish militia supported by Kurdish forces uh, from both uh, Turkey and Iraq, uh, is sweeping across uh, northeastern Syria in one of the most effective campaigns in this, in this war. And when I talk to people, they say to me, Peshmerga are good fighters in Iraq. The PYD are really good fighters. These are tough, tough fighters. You know, nobody likes to say so, but they're trained by the PKK, which is a mortal, has been a mortal enemy of the Turkish government. Uh, is considered by the Turks as a terrorist group. So from Turkey's standpoint, you have this band uh, south of their border increasingly controlled by a group uh, that is trained and to some extent run by people they, they regard as fundamentally dangerous. So Turkey has some choices to make. Um, you know, arguably that's a good thing because they'll have to make choices with us about their security uh, and, and ours. Um, I guess I'd, 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 I'd come back to the, to the basic um, 
puzzle here with, with Syria, uh, which is getting buy-in from all of the key players, Russia, whose interests are directly threatened by the collapse of the Assad regime. Uh, Turkey, you know, which has got a ragged, unstable border and, and newly uh, emboldened Kurdish militias. Uh, 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 Saudi Arabia, which thought that it wanted you know, to overthrow Bashar no matter what, but is beginning to wonder. Uh, the UAE has already defected from that uh, get rid of Bashar uh, this evening uh, line, and now with Jordan says, uh, hold on. At, at some point, um, these various powers need to work uh, together to, uh, find, to identify the elements of a new government that would include people from the army, you know, people like Farouk Shara, who are acceptable figures of the old regime, uh, people who are members of the opposition who are willing to sit down as part of a new government of transition, Alawite clan leaders uh, who have power in the, in the, in the mountains in the north, northwest in Latakia, uh, but are not part of the Assad uh, clan. Somehow that has to be done, and it's, that's, it's gonna happen. It's just a question of whether people come to their senses uh, or another 100,000 die before, before it happens. But, uh, it, it, I mean, with each of these things, you know how it's going to turn out. You just don't know when people will, will, will get the political clarity and leadership to make it happen. And I, that, again, that's what I'd hope we'll get more of from Washington. Finish up with a final question on foreign fighters. I think it's clear that a lot of young men and some young women from around the world are going to the caliphate declared by ISIS to defend it, to build it, to run it, to govern it. They see this as a state. They want to not only fight, but they want to clothe people. They want to provide food, work in the Sharia courts, be uh, parts of uh, the effort to build the infrastructure. There's lots of state building in their minds, and they want to stay there, and they see this as a, a place to live out their lives. But there's no doubt about it. Among those 20,000 plus foreign fighters, some will return, and they will be incredibly skilled and motivated. What's more of a threaten your mind, Steve and David. The returning fighters are those that are inspired by what those fighters are doing on the ground. And getting back to your point upstairs earlier, what, what are some of the challenges with regard to our well, values? It's a good question. Unfortunately, I think you have to work it from the, from the objective backwards. If there are young men who are in the United States, for example, who are inspired today to carry out a terrorist attack that's the equivalent of what took place on the beach in Tunisia just recently, then obviously that's more dangerous. Mm -hmm. However, there's nothing quite as dangerous as a seasoned combat veteran who has returned to his home with the intents of overthrowing his own government. So as a result, I think there's a new thing that has to be take place here, a new evolution of counterterrorism work that focuses on this in a way that we haven't had to before. I mean, the numbers of foreign fighters are unbelievable. I remember in the days of the uh, of the early part of the Iraq War, before the United States left, we would talk about foreign fighters on a daily basis. But the numbers were only a, a, a tenth of what we're talking about now. And as a result, it focuses the, ser the business of the services in a way that, at this moment, they are strapped because of the resources necessary to, to focus mm -hmm. on this. So it brings up the other question. I offer this as the question. I don't have the answer. I only have experience, some good, some bad, which is, let us say that if the number 20,000 foreign fighters is correct and 10,000 of them survive the war and make their way back home, how do we find them? What do we do to find them? France has begun to change their own legislation to allow themselves the ability to use modern communications in a way they've never done it before. Do we go back and revisit the question of privacy? Do we re -go, go back and revisit the question of how do we stop people who are trying to kill us, your neighbors, your friends, your brothers, your sisters, your children? I don't know the answer to that question, but I think we're going to be faced with it. And also, you're going to have to have, which has evolved, I think, quite brilliantly, and I hope David agrees with me, which is the connection between security and law enforcement services to make sure information moves quickly and effectively to try and head off terrorism attacks. Now, I'll take one last minute and say, I think our government and many of the other governments are actually become, have become quite skilled 
at finding and stopping real life terrorists on the move to the target. What I'm more worried about is our inability to stop the recruitment of people to fill the next wave. And of course, you know my theory, John, my, I think one of the greatest counterterrorism tools we have, which we don't use effectively enough, is jobs, jobs, jobs. Yeah. Here and all these places overseas. And as a result, that's the piece, that second tier of support that worries me as much as stopping the terrorists who said, I'm on the move, I'm going, I'm going to do X objective, here we go. Final comment, David? Uh, just briefly to try to sum up, um, as we think about this year since the uh, surprise overrunning of Mosul, uh, as, as uh, the Director of National Intelligence, uh, Clapper, said, uh, our underestimation of uh, ISIS's capabilities and will, a year later, essentially, we did the same thing. Uh, we, we, we underestimated their ability with a relatively small force to roll through Ramadi, and uh, the government forces uh, uh, picked up and left. Uh, so. I have concluded from this that we just don't know enough about this adversary. There are a lot of problems we've talked about in terms of the U.S. and coalition strategy, but at the top of the list, with you know all deference to Steve, who, who understands this in a way that an outsider can't, my sense is we just don't have good enough intelligence. Surely a part of that is that people have gone to school on our communications uh, collection capabilities and are smarter and U.S. technology companies are making it easier for them and adding new layers of encryption every other week. Um, so somehow uh, that intelligence gap is going to have to be made up. Uh, in Iraq, something that the U.S. did to enormous effect and power was the cycle of night raids where, you know, in the middle of the night in some place we'd identified, people would arrive, uh, they would uh, you know, it would be f firefights, you know, maybe they'd capture people if they could, but basically they were collecting intelligence, which would drive the next night's raids and the next night's and the next night's and the next night's. And then it just becomes, you gather momentum uh, because each raid feeds the information that you don't have. Uh, it's said that the Abu Sayyaf raid, the only uh, thing of that kind that we've seen from our special operations forces uh, in Syria to, to, to capture uh, turned out the wife of the chief financial officer of, uh, of ISIS uh, was effective in terms of giving lots of leads. But I don't see this problem being um, managed, and I include the foreign fighter part and the internal fight part, without better intelligence. And I honestly don't see how you get that unless you had an increased operations tempo like what we've seen uh, in, uh, in other uh, conflicts. Thank you both for those great comments. We'll open it up now. Please identify yourself and uh, your affiliation. John McGaffin. Hi, I'm John McGaffin, CSIS advisor. Um, I'd like to raise what I call the, the problem of the, or the conflict between the issue of the state and, and the amoeba. And we've been having a lot of discussions, almost exclusively, except for Steve towards the end on the state problem. How do we how much kinetic force is appropriate to use against the state? How, what are the resources? Will they still have money to operate as a state? All those things. And, and that's, a, that's a legitimate discussion. That's pretty much the way the discussion in Washington is focused. What I, what, what I wonder if we're paying enough attention to is the amoeba part of that. And by that, I mean the, the, the ever-increasing seems to me attacks abroad that Tom iterated at the beginning of, you know, from Australia to Oklahoma. And right now, they're, they're, for all the pain they cause people, uh, it's not, it doesn't move the, the geopolitical needle at all. But is there, a, is there a possibility, do you think, that as whatever progress we make against the state, that the, the examples of the amoeba spreading out into wherever that isn't a state, that doesn't have borders, will that someday get to be the point that it does become the big problem for us? You've got Yemen and you've got Libya and beyond. Well, I would offer that it already is a big problem for us. I, I was, there's a couple of realities here. One is that states like to think about the other world as the state's part 
because they have some sense of what to do with it, how to work with it. I, I, this is not a sales pitch, but I'll make it anyway. There's a wonderful group of people at the agency, called, CIA, called the PITF, the Political Instability Task Force. They've been in business for a number of years. They are currently doing some brilliant work on just this question, which is discussing the idea of how the United States must now begin to look not just as state, at state adversaries, but also these non-state adversaries who are developing significant influence in places that we didn't anticipate seeing them before. Obviously, ISIS and the Caliphate is one of those areas. There's some other places in which you have Boko Haram, which is now an influential player, which is not a state actor. And there's the extensions of ISIS and other places that also play to this. It's, it's relatively new thinking, if you will. Certainly, it, it's a post-9-11 type of thing. But it's, it's very real. There is interest in it. There is, there is good, very, very professional analytical work being done on it. It's a little bit of a difficult collection challenge in that, well, who are these people? Let's just collect them. What do we have? And of course, you've got to now figure out how to make it up so it, it actually people in the policy establishment say, well, this, is, this is real. You know, they can see how in Afghanistan, Al Qaeda had influence. But beyond that, did they have influence in Pakistan? They had enough influence to hide, not an influence to change the government. Well, that's not the case now. So my only answer to you is, you're correct. There's work being done. But it's not a routine part of government's considerations quite yet. But I think the pace is picking up where they forced, they'll be forced to consider it. Yes, yes. Ambassador Faley. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. When you see the coalition forces and the old daily talk about ISIS and others, do you feel there is a sense of urgency aligned between the countries of the region and the United States? Or do you still think that intellectually people may get it, but practically the steps are not still there? Thank you. Um, I would say, Mr. Ambassador, that the sense of urgency surely is greater today than it was last Thursday because of these attacks on, on three continents. You have a picture of a threat that's metastasizing, a threat that you know, has to be addressed in Iraq and Syria. Um, so uh, this coalition is going to have to go into a different gear in terms of its activities. Um, and I, I, it's been interesting that Prime Minister Abadi went to the G7 meeting, has been trying to be a, a, a you know, uh, presence among other coalition members. But, but somehow that's got to move into uh, something more ag aggressive. But th 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 these, these last few weeks are demonstrating that this threat is metastasizing. The only answer is uh, for the individual security services, you know, where they exist, Libya is a nightmare because it, it's fallen apart as a country. Who do you work with? But you know, the elements that the coalition will work with uh, in all these countries need to ask for help and then do the fighting. It's not, it is not going to be possible for America, America, France, and Britain, America, France, Britain, Australia, are not going to solve the problem. They're going to help. I think that's a very important question, Mr. Ambassador, because I think that everyone has accepted intellectually, but in many ways, the pieces that the coalition can really manage properly are the non-military pieces. Now, everyone who's been in harm's way is to be complimented and encouraged, but what I'm talking about is the coalition allies that are in the region are the ones best positioned to try and discuss, in Arabic, the political, economic, ideological, and the demographic changes that need to take place, as well as, dare I call it, a Middle Eastern type of Marshall Plan where the resources come to bear so that when the fighting stops, you can begin in a way that's more effective. I don't think that's taking place at the moment. So as a result, I'm afraid that you're correct that intellectually they're there, but the part that is the more practical, emotional piece hasn't yet caught up. Josh, third row in the middle, please. I'm Colonel Isaac Morogi, United States Army. I'm a medical officer and I served in Iraq. I was a command surgeon for the Office of Security Cooperation. Uh, your comments are really very refreshing. What's missing from this discussion is the, I'm originally from Mosul, city of Mosul. I'm Iraqi Christian originally. What's missing is the power of religion. You know, we saw, you know, if you look history, the Senussi movement in Libya in the 18th century, 
the Wahhabi movement and the Mahdi movement. So this element of, of radical Islamic state is not a recent issue. What's disheartening for me is the United States doctrine to respond to non-state element, such as radically motivated groups like ISIS, is non-existent. We don't have population-based outreach to disarm this agenda. And I wanted to see what your comments are. You touched bases on, on, on some of the political issues, some of the economic development. We have not seen that developing. And it's very frustrating for, for people like us to see this, this ideology is, is, is uh, permeating. And we don't have an answer to that. And I wanted to see two distinguished gentlemen what, what they thought about that. Okay. Well, I'm happy to start. Uh, I think you're absolutely right. I think somehow at the United States, now this is, remember now everyone, this is, this is citizen Kappas talking here. At the US government level, we've now become embarrassed to talk about religion, even our own. And so as a result, we have this tendency to draw back from these questions in which people who, whether, you know, I believe that ISIS, in some cases, they're fighting well, but for a horrible cause. But we still have this unwillingness to discuss with them or to assist in the discussion of the fact that what they're doing is not actually in line with their own religious beliefs and further to more, more importantly to encourage those people who can say that with clarity, with credibility, both in Saudi Arabia as the custodian of the two holiest places, as well in al Azor in Egypt, those places to encourage them to have those discussions to say, we need to cast doubt in the minds of these people who are doing this. We sure do a heck of a good job of casting doubt in our own minds, but why can't we organize ourselves in a way that we can discuss this in a fashion that is so appropriate? I mean, History is century after century after century of these discussions, and yet somehow now, in 2015, we're too embarrassed to discuss it, or we don't want to insult someone, or we don't want to have someone misunderstand. I don't understand that myself. But I think you're right on the mark. I don't, these, are, these are men who are fighting at the moment, who have woven their religion, for better or worse, into every element of their day, not just when they go to mass on Sundays. So as a result, if we're serious about Looking at that, we have to try and see what they're thinking, how they're visualizing their day and their goals, and not simply focus on the way we hear on our, you know, on our sectarian approach to this. I think you're on to something that's big, and I think that it's extraordinarily difficult for the United States government to do. The lady in the front, please. <clears throat> Hello, I'm Bayan Sami Abdurrahman. I'm the Kurdistan Regional Government representative to the United States. One thing that's been missing from the discussion, except I have to admit I arrived a little late, so I apologize if you touched on this at the beginning. What I haven't heard is any discussion of the humanitarian crisis. Three million Iraqis are displaced. Millions of Syrians are displaced. In Kurdistan region alone, we're looking after 1.8 million Syrians and fellow Iraqis. Their education is going to pot. Their health is, healthcare is almost non-existent. We in Kurdistan and other places in Iraq are very concerned about security, even in the camps. We don't want these camps to become uh, places where new radicals can be formed. So this is another crisis that we're brewing, if you like, for the future. And I'd like to hear this uh, touched on as well. Thank you. Thank you for bringing it up. There's no doubt about it. The millions of refugees and internally displaced persons, we've been to those camps on our field visits. Half of Iraq, uh, Syria's population is displaced. Uh, Turkey's hosting 1.8 million refugees at a cost of $6 billion to the country. It is a true humanitarian disaster. Hundreds of thousands murdered and killed otherwise. Uh, it, it is tremendous. Lack of education, income distribution, housing, incredible set of issues that are structural and important to the counterterrorism side as well. Any comments, David or Steve? I just would say that uh, with this as, as, as other aspects of this uh, nightmarish problem, um, the U.S. needs to lead its partners in the region and internationally in stepping up the effort so it's closer to the level of the problem. I mean, we have declaratory, again, we have declaratory policies about humanitarian issues, but, but there's no follow through. People make pledges that they never deliver. I've looked at camps uh, in, in Kurdistan. I remember just seeing the sea of tents uh, last year in northern uh, Jordan where the Syrians have come. Uh, I've seen the, the camps uh, in Turkey and 
you know, if you want to really think about it, uh, the nightmare, think about all those young men in those camps, uh, very little to eat, you know, very little jobs, money, uh, but, but, you know, radical preachers, you know, that people talking to them about settling scores. And it, it, it's, it's a formula for not just, you know, another uh, four or eight years of trouble, but, but, a, but, a, but a generation of nightmarish problems. We saw what happened when the Palestinians were dispersed and went into camps and had radicals uh, banging them every day about the struggle. And I, I think it's already, I fear it's already too late to have caught that in the de-radicalization phase, so we're, it's, you're now going to have to think about harder edge CT measures. But uh, surely, getting those, getting people back into Syria, you know, the, a settlement is urgent in Syria. I, I think uh, for the for the humanitarian reason, you've got to get people back uh, to, to their to their homes and to reasonable lives, so their kids can go to school again. Uh, yeah, That's right. We're many, many years away from that, all the way in the back in the blue shirt. Thank you. Marcus Lee with the Government Accountability Office. Uh, for the U.S. Uh, military training and advising mission, uh, simply what would success look like for both the, or I'm sorry, the Iraqi security forces, the Kurdish Peshmerga, the tribal forces training? What would you say the milestones or metrics to, uh, to show success? And then a uh, separate, smaller question, what are your thoughts on the uh, reports that some Iraqi citizens believe that the U.S. itself is funding and supporting ISIS to attack against Iraqis for the counter-messaging part of that. Thank you. Go, go ahead. On the training and assist, I mean, the benchmarks are always difficult. First of all, and I, I compliment Secretary Carter recently for talking about the fact of the shortage of Iraqi recruits for the training package. I think you have to have a series of benchmarks. Some of them will sound terribly bureaucratic, but they're actually true. Numbers of recruits, the quality of the training, how many you actually train successfully. But the ultimate, the ultimate test, the metric, is their success on the battlefield for which they are launched. But they can't do that alone in many cases when you're training them from the ground up. They then have to have the sort of support that only the United States can provide, which is command and control support. Because whether we like it or not, we still remain the best on the planet at that sort of thing. And as a result, you have to have those measuring sticks I think the other important part here is, and I'm not suggesting anyone isn't being honest about this, I'm just suggesting it's important to be terribly honest about it so you don't try to end up with a, well, no, it's really going well, and someone's so great, and then six months later you find out, well, really going well doesn't really mean what you thought it meant when you heard it the first time. So as a result, it, it, training and assist is very hard. There's some other gentlemen in this audience who are, are very aware of this too. It's very difficult. There are cultural differences, there are training differences, there are things that we assume here in the United States in terms of training military that are just not assumed in other parts of the planet. As a result, it requires a certain type of trainer, a certain person who has patience that many, who knows, many in this room may not enjoy. It requires a, a, a linguistic skills and also support that are very, very important. But it also, training and assist effectively requires the people who are the trainers to stay with it, stay with it, and stay with it, and not be just disappearing and going home. Say, okay, you know how to shoot your rifle. See you later. That simply doesn't work, and that's part of what makes it so difficult. David, many people have questioned and raised conspiracy theories in the past that the U.S. helped form al-Qaeda and supported it. And now we have a question along the same lines with regard to ISIS and opinions from Iraqi citizens. Um, I mean, the problem with the theory that we helped uh, form al-Qaeda is that it has elements of truth. Um, so it's a little tough to rebut that one. Um, it, it is amazing to me that in the face of evidence of American inability to achieve results through a projection of our power, that people continue to believe that we are all powerful. So, uh, you know, I, you know if, 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 if the Americans couldn't get the electricity going in Iraq, well, I must have had a plan not to get the electricity going in Iraq, because, I mean, they're the Americans. Of course they could do it. Um, and uh, that has been extended to ISIS. People look at ISIS and they think, how the heck did the, are these, you know, teenagers, 20, 23 year olds, running uh, rampant across our country and, and uh, our army runs away and they 
capture American tanks and, you know, uh, how could they do that? And so the answer is, well, it must be an American plot because Americans, you know, wouldn't let that happen if, I mean, they'd be crazy to let that happen. So um, the, you could argue this is our last remaining element of genuine national power, is that the way in which this, the world thinks that we could accomplish anything. Uh, we've had, we've given them, you know, a, a decade, more than a decade of evidence that that ain't so, but people don't say, still seem to think it, so maybe that's, there's a way to use that. You've convinced me, David. <laughs> In the green shirt, please. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you very much. Munzer Sleiman with Al Mayadeen Network, based in Beirut, Lebanon. Um, following what uh, Mr. Ignatius was saying, but in a different way, there is a perception and reality in the region about the seriousness of U.S. and the coalition to fight Daesh. Forget the conspiracy issue. Is it really a priority for the United States and its key allies in the coalition in the region to fight Daesh as the primary danger, the serious danger, the priority, or let's say the potential influence of Iran as a regional power in the context of what's going on in the region? There's two camps, the Sunni camp and the Shia camp are fighting. That's the perception. To a certain degree, there is some uh, signs of uh, uh, reality about that. So is the United States capable of advancing fighting Daesh, ISIS, or Al-Qaeda, who is being forgotten in Yemen now, over Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, others, who, are, who they have their priority to settle in the region against Iran or removing Assad regime. Who is driving the policy now? I'll take a first quick shot. It's a great question, um, and it goes to the heart of, of, of the U.S. problem. We're trying to mobilize Sunni allies to fight uh, ISIS, Daesh, who are more motivated to fight Iran and Shia power. <clears throat> and you know, that is the um, basic uh, problem of our strategy. I talked earlier about some ideas I have about how you deal with that, but I think you've identified the, the core knot here, that, that um, this is not a top priority for a weary United States, and it also isn't a top priority for our Sunni allies. Mm -hmm. Ron Marks. Thank you, guys. This is a wonderful session. David, you wrote an interesting article recently on Homeland Security and some of the challenges over there. Given what's happened in the last few days in terms of the attacks overseas at this point, how comfortable are you that we actually have the wherewithal and the understanding at this point about what kind of recruitment is going on in the U.S. from ISIS and what kind of actions might be taken here? I'm very uncomfortable. I don't want to be alarmist when I've asked uh, the uh, FBI and the intelligence community in the last uh, days uh, whether they're concerned about specific uh, threats uh, in the July 4 period. The answer has been, has been no. We have no credible specific threat. Uh, but just read the messaging. The appeals to lone wolves go out you know, dozens of times a day, and there are manifestos about how to make weapons, how to disguise your communications, how to hide, how to kill, how to, it's all out there. And the FBI has been lucky in catching people who seem infected, but um, really nothing more you can say is you just, you, you know this problem is getting worse and uh, you, you're all sort of waiting, you know, uh, at some point, some Tunisia is going to happen in Britain or France or America. Who knows? But it's, it's, I mean, we know it's coming. I, I would only add, Ron, uh, there's some people who have extraordinary skills in finding terrorists in, in our government now. But sometimes, and the American people have the right to assume that they're going to be defended against this sort of thing. But the American people also need to understand there's something we used to call the grind of counterterrorism work that is really quite important here, and that is the never letting go, grind day after day, working with the same information, being aware, aware, aware. And if that ever falters, then I would be more worried than I am now. But I do think the United States is a big place. 
And there are a lot of communities that I now travel through in my travels in the United States in which I see people that I've never seen there before. Now, I'm not suggesting that they're a terrorist just because I thought they looked like a terrorist. What I'm suggesting is the ability to find someone in the United States is not as easy as everyone thinks. There used to be a, you know, you know when someone, one of the reasons you can't find somebody is because they're hiding. So as a result, that grinding work that the FBI is doing, that the IC is doing, to just keep after it is extraordinarily important to trying to contribute to what DHS and Jay Johnson are doing every day. Judge Webster, did you have a question? Okay, great. We'll, we'll end with Judge Webster. Thank you. And Bill Webster currently with Homeland Security Advisory Council. My question is one about perseverance. And I can't help but think back uh, to the early days of Desert Shield when we had to beg for permission to land troops to help the, our friends, the Saudi Arabians, who said, but you land and you always leave. And in that highly tribal area, I'm wondering where we stand on their sense of our perseverance and when we come in to help in a sort of piecemeal way and avoiding issues like boots on the ground and other things of this kind. Do we still have this problem and what can we do about it? if we really want to lead them out of this world. Thank you. Judge, you sound like you might have been a director of the CIA at one point. <laughs> I think that is an incredibly important point and question. The engagement with people that I've made reference to before must be engagement beyond the turnover of offices that we have so frequently in the United States and our government here in Washington. It must be an expression of a commitment that and we in the CIA, quite frankly, we do this all the time because we do stay all the time. You know that. But they, it's important to many of these countries we deal with to know that no matter how bad it gets, that we have the guts to stay with them. Now, we have been very good at that over the last number of years. I, I would, it would be my assessment that some of that was reflected in the low attendance at the President's Camp David Accord on Middle East policy and Middle East redirection. I don't think you can understate the importance of what you've described. I don't think you can understate the importance of every now and then a president in a discreet channel, if we can ever do that anymore, reassuring the head of that nation, that king, that monarch, that president, that prime minister, that, listen, we know this is getting bad, and publicly these things may happen, but we're not going away. Those, if I was asked once, I was asked 50 times by Pakistani prime ministers, presidents, and chief of the army staff, well, when are you leaving? I was always able to say, well, you know I'm not going anywhere, and you know the CIA never goes anywhere. But I wasn't always able to be that confident with the United States government. First of all, every single Army officer in uh, Pakistan remembers the famous uh, uh, Pressler Amendment that broke it off for a decade. So you've hit on something that I think is important to the United States that we must continue to encourage in our people, our new people in government, re-encourage in the people who are more mature in the government and just stay after and stay after. I don't think you can underestimate the value of what you've just described. David, how do we do that when the general public and the president are, as you said, allergic to This doesn't Iraq. require the public. I'm talking about contacts and commitments at the U.S. government mm -hmm. level that does not mean sure. 100,000 U.S. troops. I'm talking about the appearance of people when things are bad to say, listen, can we help? Or we need a favor from you. Those types of things are the things that go far longer than trying to show up with 100,000 troops. Sure, I, I agree with that, and no one's discussing 100,000 troops, but nonetheless, we do have to deal with a, a, a U.S. public, apart from those elements yeah. you're talking about, Steve, and a, a Congress, part of it, and an administration, and potentially a next administration that does not want to make a commitment on, on many levels. Well, I've been encouraged that a president who uh, passionately wanted to get out of this period of involvement in places like Iraq and Syria, realize that it's impossible. Uh, and as I said at the beginning, has basically the right policy. I, I said he's allergic, but you know, he is trying to work with Prime Minister Abadi, a, you know, the NSC talks uh, with uh, Ambassador Filey, I assume, an attempt to coordinate policy. And, and, and I'll close by remembering something that uh, a Syrian foreign minister said a after 
President Reagan, you know, our model of the strong president, decided to pull American forces out of Beirut in 1983-84. And he said, the Americans are short of breath. And I think that is when that idea first began to settle into the minds of people in the Middle East. And each subsequent instance of shortness of breath reinforces it. And each moment where despite shortness of breath, who's more shorter breath than Barack Obama? He doesn't want to be there, but he is there. So maybe over time that adds the idea that we're more persistent than people might think. I hope so. I wish we had more time. We have a lot of other questions, um, but I would like to thank David and Steve for giving us tremendous insight on a very difficult topic, and I hope we can have you back sometime. Thank you very much. Thank you.